nobody was talking about him. Alternative to Spotify, the RIA, Netflix, etc. And so this would normally have a guest or two. Today is a little bit behind, so things might be a little bit of a gong show today. But unfortunately, none of my invited guests are interested today, so it is just me. And also, unfortunately, my MP3 player is still broken. So I've gone a solid week without listening to any music whatsoever. I have been kind of really hurting on this side because I've been really hoping to bring you something this week and it just has not panned out. So a reminder to you out there listening, if you have some music in your life that you enjoy, maybe something that's been uh, just created recently, maybe there's some new bands out there that are creating music that is Creative Commons or otherwise free culture, meaning you can share it freely, you can remix it, you can do, you can post it on different platforms, you can take it and do interesting things with it. Unfortunately, this, and especially the record industry or the, the companies that own most of the music in the world, of which there are not very many. The RAA is something like a hundred different companies or a couple hundred different companies, but most of the big ones that you will have heard of and most of the music you will have heard of is owned by only a very select few companies and the number is shrinking every year. We have seen media conglomeration and concentration on an unprecedented scale and it, specifically this year with Fox and Disney being one entity. We're starting to see bigger and bigger collections of media, not just music, uh, but media generally, being in the hands of smaller and smaller numbers of individuals. So if you want to uh, have a culture to call your own, your culture is basically owned by the, the, the small handful of people that own the financial system, that own the movie industry, that own uh, and use their power to do things like, oh, I don't know, create concentration camps in the States and in Australia, and to uh, fund FUD campaigns against action on climate change, etc. So there's reasons why you may not want to have the music in your life be utterly controlled by those particular individuals. But nevertheless, I do not have anything for you on that side today. Sorry to the world. I will try by next week to one, get an mp3 player and two, actually listen to some things uh, so that I can share with you. But in the meanwhile, music is not the only thing that's going on in the world. There is, of course, other things, and I didn't get a chance to talk about too much of what was going on in the outside world last week because I had a great guest with a lot of interesting things to say. So I do have a couple of things from kind of last week that were percolating up uh, to me. Uh, the first is the Coronavirus Papers, uh, published by the I.EU. And I will link this into this video thread here. I'll get the thread up so I can post things if anyone wants to follow along. There goes that link. So for those of you following over the past couple of weeks have been a little, I don't know if you want to call it a minor pandemic going on in China, loading up the statistics page uh, put on by, I think it's John Hopkins University. They're claiming minimum, uh, this is like the probably bare minimum, 71,230 cases of uh, Wuhan coronavirus or whatever they're not. Now see what the ID 19 with a 10,869 recovered, 1,770 deaths. So 
It does seem to be plateauing, uh, so hopefully this is kind of the, the beginning of the end of it, as far as this week is concerned. Of course, we do have reasons to be skeptical of the mainland China's numbers, and so it is worth looking at the other locations as kind of the uh, important metric. But even in that case, if you look at the logarithmic chart of the number of cases of coronavirus, it does seem to be leveling off a little bit. So it's still increasing in incidence. There's still people getting it. Uh, and that number is still kind of increasing day by day. Let's see, actually, the, this is the first day where uh, there were no increases outside of China. So in China, the number is still kind of going up, but everywhere else in the world, uh, it's kind of stabilizing. So this may be the beginning of the end, or maybe it's just kind of a false sense of security. We will find out in later weeks uh, as public health systems around the world kind of cope with what they've got. But nevertheless, the coronavirus papers is a collection of uh, scientific papers published by the i.eu, which, let's see, what is the i.eu here? Why, okay, so, quote, as put by the archive team, technology is business, and in business, money often takes priority over ethics. With the law perpetually lagging behind technology and business, there's often nothing between you getting screwed over besides your own volition. Living without the knowledge of our past history, origin, and culture is like a tree without roots. Corporations do not contemplate their own inevitable end. At least they don't do it in public unless they're in really bad shape. When times are good, those thoughts are pushed away and end users are encouraged to do the same. When times are bad, they tend to go very bad very quickly. If you're lucky, you'll have an announcement. Your data is never totally safe. Backing up your data is always necessary, even if it's stored elsewhere. The internet is a worldwide platform for sharing information. It is a community of common interests. Our mission at the eye is to preserve pieces of digital history. We are digital librarians. There we are. So basically, the, this is a, a reinterpretation of the ideal of a library. And uh, the by the way, the ideal of a library has changed over the centuries. I'm reading a history book on the history of libraries in Ontario right now, and it has changed. The idea of a, a library used to not necessarily mean that it was free, that there was an expectation that there would be libraries that you could go to for maybe like an hour a week uh, in your community and that you'd have to pay for it, but that once you paid for it, you'd have access to the, the some knowledge that you would kind of expect uh, out of your community. And this would be in the order of maybe tens of thousands or thousands of books. Uh, but this is what this is providing. This is a free, uh, in this case, uh, service to download thousands and thousands of these scientific papers on uh, the coronavirus, or at least coronaviruses generally. And many of them are probably going to be well beyond my head. Uh, this is going to be for subject matter experts, for people in biology, cell biology, or people interested in cell biology, people interested in learning about how uh, cells work and how viruses work, at least as far as these particular papers have uh, studied or, or drawn information out of them. Uh, so they range from about, let's see, the earliest one is from 1968, um, the virology of coronaviruses, all the way through 2020, the use of cells uh, from ANPAP knockout pigs uh, to evaluate something, uh, let's see, uh, to evaluate the role of aminopeptidase NAPN as a receptor for porcine delta coronaviruses, PDCOV. So it is probably not legal to for them to be hosting these things. Some of these papers are probably in the just old WGET, which I've talked about in a previous Facebook post. Hopefully all of the people listening to this who are uh, connected to me on Facebook already have WGET installed. Otherwise you may have to get WGET. Uh, it's kind of a recursive problem if you don't have it sometimes, but it is basically just a tool for you to grab all of these papers. And so you could start reading. If you wanted to learn about the coronavirus, or at least about coronaviruses generally, you can just download this whole set of papers and go through it and read it. And you'll probably learn a lot of things that, personally, I do not have time to learn this. But what's interesting, though, is that, one, Facebook has censored this link. So I probably, actually, yeah, I, I can't even post it in this thread. I was wondering why it wasn't showing up. And that's the reason. <laughs> Facebook does not let you share these papers. And in particular, not only is Facebook censoring this link, but the website itself it tries to kind of stay on the, the right side of the law a little bit in terms of they have a DMCA takedown request, which is something required by US law. But if you think about it for more than a second, you start thinking, okay, well, what is the point of having uh, the ability for publishers, uh, maybe Elsevier or whoever, uh, to send them takedown requests. The only possible outcome of that kind of takedown request is the scientific community, broadly speaking, including uh, 
gentleman scientists like Kelly, as we had in a couple shows earlier, or just people interested in learning about how viruses work, suddenly now do not have access to that paper. So it is a travesty that they have to do that and that they have removed some papers. Apparently, you can get in contact with them and discuss the papers that have been taken down. They will not send you those papers, but they will give you little helpful reminders of maybe what those papers are. So you can do things like go to SciHub and just grab them yourself, which is probably how they got all these papers in the first place. SciHub, uh, I'll post that to the thread, uh, is a wonderful place. And just as a reminder for those of you who do not use it, uh, it is a useful way to, if you have a paper you're interested in reading that is not available in a library like the I, that you can just plug in the DOI uh, identifier uh, that should be listed somewhere in the, the web page for the paper into SciHub. SciHub will know what that is and will produce the paper for you, sometimes making you type in a couple of letters to just prove you're a human being before they do that. Very, very powerful tool, very, very useful in the 21st century. but. Nevertheless, it's just really, really sad that this link is not postable on Facebook. And that means that this is a missing piece of the puzzle of how we should be reacting to this possible pandemic. And if Facebook is not going to do this for us, if Facebook is not going to allow us to share this scientific knowledge, we should be moving off of Facebook as individuals, as friends, as communities, as whatever. Granted, this is going to take a while. Uh, there's a billion people using Facebook Plus, uh, so we're not going to be able to pull all of those people out immediately, but we need to start moving away from the, this particular platform and into platforms like the Fediverse, like Ricochet, like Plume, like uh, Gab even, like Steam, like any of these alternative platforms that are not controlled by this company that's willing to censor scientific knowledge that it's of direct importance to the prevention of deaths of people by this this virus that is killing people. It's already killed over a thousand people, bare minimum, probably a lot more. We don't have the full picture of what's going on in China. But anyway, it's, it's just something that we should be moving on already, but that's where we are today. So that's the first thing going on. The second thing going on is the situation in China as far as the coronavirus is concerned. So, uh, okay, this is from Shubat, which is unfortunately on Cloudflare. Uh, I'm going to talk more about Cloudflare on a later episode. I do not have time to talk about Cloudflare today. So, quote, citizen journalists covering the coronavirus epidemic are going missing mysteriously. Let's actually double check this one on Snopes. See what they have on this. They have a bunch on, they have nothing. Okay, so this, I don't recognize Shubat. Uh, Shubat is, it could be fake news. So I, I want to, let's see. Yeah, they're definitely anti-Bernie Sanders. A very, very pro-Christian, radical Christian website. But nevertheless, uh, this is where they're, they're kind of covering this. So, quote, China has a history of, as it is with many dictatorial countries, making people disappear who say things that the government does not like. Now there are reports that citizen journalists covering the coronavirus are also disappearing as the government cracks down harder on social media in what appears to be an attempt to obscure the true extent and effect of the virus. Quote, over the past couple of weeks, citizen journalists uh, Chen Qixi, if I'm pronouncing that right, and Feng Bin have served as the world's eyes and ears inside the epicenter of the coronavirus outbreak in the city of Wuhan. Broadcasting via their mobile phones, they've offered a glimpse of how dire things have been. Many of these videos have been posted to Twitter and reposted to YouTube. Now one of them is missing. Chen has been out of reach for more than 20 hours, and this is as of uh, February 8th. So let's see if we uh, Google him here. Uh, Chen Quixi. Let's see what comes up. He's got a website. He's got a paste bin. Quote, uh, on Wikipedia, Chen disappeared on 6th, February 2020. Friends have been unable to contact him since 8 p or 7 p.m. UTC plus 8 on, Feb on 6 February. On 7 February, family and friends received news from the authorities that Chen had been detained at an undeclared time and place and held in an unknown location. The authorities claimed that the reason for the detention was quarantine. And then this links to... CNN. So CNN is also covering the same thing. Uh, so in this case, at least as far as Shubat and CNN are concerned, this is probably legitimate. Again, hard to know. Both CNN and Shubat. I don't know exactly how much to trust them on this, but let's uh, just kind of roll with it for the moment. And Twitter was becoming the last line of defense for people to gather information and record the trauma of thousands of families we're experiencing. Quote. Uh, this is, uh, of course, incorrect. Uh, Twitter is definitely 
definitely not the last line of defense because there is the Fediverse. The Fediverse is there for people to uh, express their trauma. And it is still, at least as far as I know, available behind the Great uh, Firewall of China. It is not big enough yet for them to have totally banned it. And as well, you can, even if they do manage to ban it, use Tor, which does still work in China, at least as of the past couple of weeks, which would allow you to do things like access the Fediverse. So I keep kind of hammering on this Fediverse over and over and over again. And yet nobody I know is on it. <laughs> it's really sad. I think uh, there was like two or three people who have joined. One of the servers, unfortunately, went down taking down one of their accounts and then I think the other two haven't really posted since they joined so that's kind of unfortunate but it's it's worth kind of pointing out though when people go missing like this because I have seen reports and I'm not going to bring them up right at this very moment where people are being transported to either quarantine centers or if they're already dead, let's say, taken to what seems like cremation centers that have been built specifically for this pandemic in Wuhan. Now, again, it's hard to get verification of these things because the information from Wuhan is being so heavily censored. So are there actually uh, incineration centers going on? Are people being put into quarantine centers and these so-called hospitals that have been built? Hard to verify. But it does stand to reason, though, that when you have a dictatorship, that if there is a process for just picking people up and throwing them in the incinerator, that the dissidents may very well be brought, swept up into this. And so it would be interesting to make sure that that is not happening. Uh, this We don't know what's happened to this Chen Kuishi. Again, I can't verify this one way or another, but... I think it's worth paying attention to him and his particular case and to see if he does resurface and to, to check this particular story in a couple of weeks to see maybe a after the kind of ex expected course of the this particular coronavirus is done. So let's say three weeks from now, what happened to this guy? Was he even a real person? That sort of thing. That's the sort of thing worth kind of checking right now. Now. That's not the only thing going on. The other thing going on is uh, this week saw, or this past couple of weeks, saw some huge action in British, or the area of British Columbia. This is from Ricochet Media. A quote, RCMP raid, and I'm probably going to pronounce this wrong, Unistoten Healing Center arrest matriarchs. Uh, quote, Frida Hassan, if I'm pronouncing that right, and others were arrested on the fifth day of the police raid in northwestern BC, with few journalists on site to report it. Now, pause. The reason there are so few journalists on site to record it uh, is because the RCMP was threatening journalists with both arrest and possibly even violence. There is a, quote, lethal overwatch or whatever in the area where the RCMP was literally threatening to kill people and had guns pointed at protesters, although apparently According to the reporting done by the journalists who kind of braved arrest or whatever, they've been trying to prevent the press from seeing the guns pointed at these protesters and to uh, keep the journalists from reporting specifically on the tactics they were using, uh, these kind of hyper-militarized tactics that the RCMP was actually using. That is supposed to be a secret. We're not supposed to know about that. So that's kind of interesting on its own right. But, quote, standing in front of a sign reading reconciliation, you know, Stoughton matriarch Frida Hassan and other fam or women family members sang and drummed in ceremony as the RCMP officers descended to arrest those in the way of the construction of the coastal gas link natural pipeline. Pause. So I've seen this, the screen cap or the picture of this happening, where there's literally a barrier that has a big word reconciliation on it. And it was the RCMP who was dismantling this. And so now there's the hashtag going around is reconciliation is dead. There are protests all over Canada going on from all kinds of First Nation groups, all many of which do not normally get along, but have been united in seeing that this clear violation of the intent and spirit of reconciliation has been broken, and violently broken, and broken kind of with prejudice by the Trudeau government and their militarized RCMP. And so, continuing on, the women were gathered on a bridge adorned with red dresses, pause, these red dresses are not just any red dresses, these are special, what's wet and red, or some kind of special red dress, like th this is a dress, uniform red dress, this is not just a, I want to look pretty red dress, this is a red dress that has some kind of significant meaning behind it. Anyway, continuing on, in memory of the murdered and missing indigenous girls, women, and 
to spirit people. We'll talk about that later. Industri or industry workers later took the dresses down. RCMP officers said they were authorized to use as much force as necessary, reported the Narwhal's Amber Bracken. Now, why is there even a news site called the Narwhal, but whatever. Uh, quote, who is on site? As of publication time, Bracken said at least seven arrests have been made. Hassan was arrested, along with Dr. Carla Tate, Director of Clinical Services at the government-funded Unistoten Healing Center, Brenda Mitchell, who's known as Tate's aunt and Mitchell's sister. The three women spoke with Ricochet earlier about the importance of caring for the land. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Uh, this is the fifth day this this happened, at least, of a protracted police raid of four wet sweating sites along an isolated road in northwestern BC. Unistoten is the final target of RCMP enforcement of a provincial court injunction. So this is all stemming from a provincial court injunction, very interesting to note, to allow coastal gas workers access to the area. Critics say police actions have gone beyond the injunction, as officers have been clearing out all West Wetton people and supporters from an ever-expanding exclusion zone. Governments don't direct the courts and they don't direct the RCMP, said Premier John Horgan when, while taking questions at an unrelated afternoon press conference in New Westminster. More than a battle over the pipeline, the conflict is a clash between Indigenous and Canadian systems of law. What's when hereditary chiefs have not consented to the pipeline. And I'm, I'm going to pause here. When they say that, basically there are two sets of, of chiefs for this particular uh, band of First Nations because they have never ceded their territory. They've never uh, signed a treaty saying that they would agree to work within the context of the Canadian legal system. The Canadian legal system under the Indian Act has basically appointed some d democratically elected, but representatives for this group, and those representatives are, are giving the go-ahead, perhaps, to this coastal gasoline pipeline, but the <laughs> hereditary families that have led this, this particular tribe uh, for as long as they have been around, perhaps, or have basically put their foot down and said, no, we're not allowing this pipeline to go through. Now, there is a difference between these these two groups, but there is no reason to accept the legitimacy of the, or the Canadian government basically taking ownership over this land and therefore taking ownership over the governance of the, the land. So this is kind of bringing to the, the surface uh, something that would not normally have been of national interest to this kind of really, really minor point of governance. But it turns out to really matter in terms of when they actually send in the RCMP to enforce this court order. And especially given the amount of violence and the, the amount of uh, removing journalists and, and making it very likely that further violence would occur unseen by the eyes of the public uh, when that kind of happens. But when they go and do this, like th this is, how would I put it? They Anyway, I, I'm, I'm losing my train of thought here. I'll just continue on the story. Quote, On Friday, Ricochet's journalists were prevented from traveling in the direction of Unistoten's site. The RCMP was similarly restricted the access of other media outlets, including the CBC. Uh, that, that's kind of new to me. Quote, After a sustained public outcry over the issues of press freedom on Sunday evening, police emailed select media outlets to invite them to observe the raid. Journalists were required to meet the RCMP at 6 a.m., Scant seven hours later and agreed to be detained in a single lo location near the bridge during the raid. Detained is kind of an interesting word to use there, uh, but that's probably accurate. <laughs> Quote, it was concession by the force, which was threatening to arrest reporters just last Thursday. Uh, Global Sarah McDonald accepted the offer to travel into the area with police. She drove up with the police at 6 a.m. Uh, PT, uh, Pacific time, this morning. Bracken and another journalist, Amanda Follett, I was good, and with the Thai... Uh, are situated in this Unistoten. So, and then it starts talking about the rests around the country, which kind of begins in Vancouver. But the point here is that they really have shown the true face of the Canadian government in this situation, where they can talk a good talk about being willing to work with First Nations to rectify past grievances. But here is a really simple chance, and an obvious chance, to work with the local First Nations rather than just using violence to take their land, brutalize them, including old, little old ladies. Like This isn't like Oka, for example, where the RCMP was primarily seemed to be targeting young military age men in a very military-like uh, conflict. This is peaceful. This is a lot closer to the Standing Rock situation where it's peaceful protesters and 
defenseless young and old women versus the full violence of the Canadian government that under a liberal regime. That is what this situation is. And so we get to see it in person and we get to be alive to, to witness it. And then the question is, is what do we do? What, what can we do? And the answer this week has been, again, more peaceful, nonviolent protests across the country, keeping things like via rail uh, and the rail networks generally from being able to fully operate by having blockades both, I haven't heard of any permanent blockades, but day long protests to keep trains from moving. A couple hour long protests in all of the major cities, including Saskatoon, to keep people aware <laughs> of what's going on and to kind of wake people up. And so far that's the extent of it. But this hasn't ended yet. And we are still kind of in this stage where that peaceful protest doesn't seem to be getting any results, but who knows, maybe they'll keep putting on the pressure and we'll see some results uh, later on. But there was oh, two, two kind of things worth pointing out. One is there was apparently some kind of a vote done, and this may or may not be propaganda from the oil side, but there was at least the, the rumor has it from my understanding that the majority of people in the wet sweat and first nations clans or whatever are actually for this pipeline and so there is this internal difference in, in dialogue that is being that is happening where the people who are directly affected by it are still interested in this pipeline happening however and using this as a justification to take their land and put the pipeline through anyway goes way too far because if this was actually true and if there is a difference of opinion in between the hereditary chiefs and the people who kind of live under them, whether it be purely a matter of who represents them or this particular pipeline project or whatever, that is something that they should be dealing with themselves. It should not be the Canadian government stepping in to enforce with a militarized police the outcome of that internal First Nations debate. This is not something that we in the outside of that particular territory should have any input in other than just mere suggestions of a peaceful nature. The fact that we have taken, and we as Canadians have taken, this step, or at least our representatives in government has, this is going to have implications for what they're going to accept later on. And so again, that's something that they're going to have to deal with on their side, but we have made a royal mess of that particular area and its politics now, uh, and the whole country, uh, really, is going through a, a really rough time politically because of this. So we are already seeing things like, uh, I just saw a report on Facebook suggesting there's chlorine that would normally be going to treat water in big cities is not reaching the big cities. So there may be water shortages, there may be fuel shortages in Eastern Canada and all kinds of things that would normally be delivered by train are being delayed. Of course, the kind of context for that is that there's been boil water advisories in reserves all around the country for a long time now and so the context of that happening is that the other side of this the first nations who are blockading those rail lines are not uh, super uh, shall we say empathetic to the the plight of people who may have to be under a boil water advisory for maybe a day or two uh, that that may be something worth considering but even so we have to work together as a country and not just throw the weight of the government around if we are going to have a country that works together in order to have things like clean water and food going from one side of the country to the other. There is a consequence for using the militarized police on people when the people who are in their lives, the, in their perhaps extended families, in their extended social circles, come out to support them. Because that is the expected consequence of that. If some a government entity comes and takes me away, I would hope that the people in my life would, at the very least, write a strongly worded letter. <laughs> I don't know, maybe public protest might be appropriate. I don't know what the, the expected response would be, but I would hope there would be at least some response. And similarly so, the, the people who are in Saskatchewan right now complaining that, oh, you know, the the, the roads are being blocked and we should arrest all these other protesters. Uh, they're not really seeing the, the big picture, which is, of course, that once people start getting arrested en masse for things like that, the people in their lives start getting pissed off too. And so we are in, caught in this, this vicious circle right now uh, where more and more people are getting angry. And 
justifiably so, right? That their their land is being taken. There is a, a real deep disrespect being shown for peaceful protesters right now. And in particular here in Saskatchewan, there was a person who drove through a crowd of peaceful protesters. Nobody was injured. Nobody was hit hard enough to be badly hurt. There were some people caught in front of this car as it was moving. But the courts up and decided that this was not worth criminal charges for and that this person just got off scot-free. Which has then led to, or at least been kind of correlated with, other videos of people posting revving up to to hit protesters, as at least uh, in in terms of big trucks, right? And this is something that, again, I have a little bit of experience with this. I have stared down trucks, uh, daring them to hit me. And so there are going to be people who are not going to move. They are not going to budge. And so if we have as a culture here in Canada, this kind of cultural norm that allows people with big trucks to just rev up and smash into crowds of people, we're going to see stuff like happened in Charleston in the United States where people died. Uh, this is, we are really, really close to that happening right now. And once that line is crossed, I, that, that is a line that we don't want to be crossed because like, again, we could start asking ourselves, well, what would we do in that situation if someone started hitting protesters with their cars, right? That is something I personally have a very guttural, instinctual reaction to. And I'm not going to go through the details in a public video like this, but we don't want to have them cross that line. And we, we don't want to make it seem like it's possible for them to cross that line without consequences. Because... Again, the Canadian side seems to be trying to believe that there's this way to, to just keep going and keep pushing through uh, this particular uh, boundary in the wet, with sweat and land without any consequences happening. But there will be consequences. We can bet on them. This is not something that is just going to go away. So anyway, that's, that's kind of enough on that for the moment. And it is, we are starting to get a little bit on the late side here. Uh, this is going to be a little bit of a shorter video because... I started a little bit late and I do not have the two songs I intended to have. So if you have anything you would like me to talk about in future episodes or any Creative Commons or free music, please do send them. And as usual, uh, there will be a subscriber story link uh, posted wherever this video is posted. So hopefully you enjoyed this particular broadcast. I'm a little scatterbrained today. Hopefully we'll have more people to help out next week. We'll see you then. Just a moment, we're a